expected on the federal regulations bill. The House started yesterday. A live look at the U.S. Capitol with the flag at half staff. It's Pearl Harbor Day, and we're likely to hear a number of more speeches about the 70th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Up next, live coverage of the U.S. House here on C-SPAN. House will be in order. Prayer will be offered today by our guest chaplain, Reverend Roger Schoolcraft uh, from Fayetteville, Arkansas. Almighty and most high God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you led our forefathers to weave your presence in the fabric of our nation. Move us also to acknowledge and trust your presence among us daily. And although we may face many obstacles and adversities, continue to shower us with your mercy that we may recover. Today, we thank you for healing our nation from the attack on Pearl Harbor 70 years ago. We are grateful for all those who sacrificed their lives to preserve our freedom. O oh Lord, may we not squander it. Bless all wounded warriors, veterans, and their families. Fill them and us with your peace and joy this Christmas season. Give us wisdom and lead us by your spirit that the choices made here would result in our country united, an economy restored, and hearts grateful for your loving care. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. The Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Without objection, uh, the gentleman from uh, Arkansas, Mr. Womack is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today it is my privilege to introduce the Reverend Roger Schoolcraft of Fayetteville, Arkansas. Reverend Schoolcraft retired from the ministry in 2008 after nearly 40 years in the ministry, serving congregations in Iowa, Nebraska, and most recently Northwest Arkansas, where he led St. John's Lutheran Church in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Reverend Schoolcraft was called to the ministry in 1953 after accepting an invitation from a friend to attend a Sunday school class at St. John's Lutheran Church in Rochester, uh, Michigan. Mr. Speaker, Reverend Schoolcraft's service extends well beyond the walls of the church. He served as campus pastor of the Lutheran Student Center at the University of Arkansas. He was a circuit counselor for 11 years and was assistant dean and dean for two national campus missionary institutes. Locally, he was president of Cooperative Emergency Outreach, secretary treasurer of the Fayetteville Ministerial Alliance, and treasurer for the Council of Religious Organizations. Reverend Schoolcraft is married to Deborah Steen Schoolcraft, and they have two children, Andrea and Aaron. On behalf of the United States House of Representatives, I want to thank Reverend Schoolcraft for his long-standing devotion to the ministry, the churches he has served, and his fellow man. And I yield back. The chair will entertain up to 15 further requests for one-minute speeches from each side of the aisle. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio rise? Madam Speaker, request unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized.
Madam Speaker, I'd like to congratulate the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Randy Holgren, on winning our friendly wager on the MAC football championship game last Friday. The participants in the game, Ohio University and Northern Illinois University, are located in the districts that we're privileged to represent. The game was an instant classic. Both teams left everything on the field, gave it their all, and in the process, made their universities and their fans proud. The OU Bobcats jumped out to an early lead, but the Huskies of Northern Illinois fought back, showed their toughness, and won the game on the game's final play. Another way to say it is that OU won the first half, Northern Illinois won the second half. Both teams were worthy of participation in the game, and it's a shame that each team had to come out on the losing end. I'm very proud of the OU Bobcats, and I look forward to watching both teams compete in their bowl games and representing their schools in the same fashion they did last Friday night. With that, I yield back. Congratulations to Congressman Holgren. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado rise? Permission to address the House for one minute, revise and extend. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A huge tax increase is looming unless this House takes action immediately. Unless this House takes action in the next few weeks, a typical American household earning fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year will see a tax increase of one thousand dollars a year on payroll taxes. Yes, Madam Speaker, a thousand dollar tax increase for middle class families, many of whom have not seen any raises or increases for several years due to the recession. People who are struggling to support their families will see a thousand dollar tax increase if this body does not act in the next several weeks. This is a tax increase that most families haven't budgeted for, haven't prepared for. They haven't assumed that this Congress is as dysfunctional as it potentially is if we fail to renew this tax increase. We shouldn't let our dysfunction in this body harm the American middle class and the American people. I call upon my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support renewing the payroll tax extension to make sure the middle class families are not slapped with a $1,000 plus tax increase next year. I yield back the balance of my time. Question permission to address the House for one minute. Madam Speaker, Shahar, a Pakistani woman in an arranged marriage, was constantly raped and abused by her husband. He accused her of becoming a doctor only to attract men. He blamed her for the miscarriage that she had, and he constantly beat her. He was angry when she gave birth to two girls rather than to two boys, and he was an abuser of the girls and his wife. Shahar and her daughters were able to escape to the United States to find safety. She will not go back to Pakistan because her former husband's family say they will kill her. Violence against women, unfortunately, is too common of a plight for women throughout the world. My grandmother used to tell me that you never hurt somebody you claim you love. As the leader of the free world, it is critical that the United States promotes this simple truth throughout this country, throughout this country and other countries. Every person has the right to a life free of violence, and I want to thank the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for bringing this attention to the members of Congress as we reflect on this fact during these 16 days against gender violence. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois rise? To address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in 1996, Congress passed the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA. It was then, as it still is today, an affront to our country's values. Values we hold true as established in the Declaration of Independence of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and of equality and fairness for all. On October 7th of this year, I held a field forum in Chicago with my colleague Jan Schakowsky to hear from legal experts and gay and lesbian couples about the real-world harm caused by DOMA. The findings were startling. I asked that the clerk enter all their testimony into the record to formally document this collection of unfairness and inequity, burdens that are imposed on normal Americans just trying to live a normal life. It is incomprehensible that today we are still dealing with such injustice. Congress created this injustice, and Congress should correct it. Let the re record reflect these sentiments. Thank you, and I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois rise? I request permission to address the House for one The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. $1.75 trillion annually. Americans' job creators are buried under regulatory burden of about $1.75 trillion annually. The cost of regulatory burden from new regulations just this year is $67.4 billion, which is larger than the entire state budget of Illinois, my home state. 
Studies and polls have shown us time and again that the regulations are a hidden form of taxation, and just as our tax code is in need of reform, so is our regulatory system. That's why I'm proud to support the RAINS Act. This common sense bill will require that Congress approve every new ma major regulation proposed by the executive branch to ensure that Congress, not unelected bureaucrats, retain control and accountability for the impact of government on the American people. Unless Congress act decisively, this unchecked regulatory state will only grow bigger and make things more complicated. Let's pass the RAINS Act and give our job creators the certainty they need to grow, expand, and put Americans back to work. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Madam Speaker, that's the minute. The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, this year will be a very difficult holiday season for millions of Americans looking for jobs. Sadly, these families are not getting the help they deserve from the Republicans here in Congress. We have now reached 337 days of Republican control here in the House, and we still do not have a jobs plan from the Republicans. Benefits for over 6 million unemployed Americans are about to expire. And now to make matters worse, Republicans are uncertainty about the 160 middle, middle class families by stalling and extending the payroll tax cut. Why are these Americans forced to wait? Because Republicans refuse to ask more than those that are paying their fair share. Millions of uh, millionaires are not paying their fair share. We must act now on those lifelines of the middle class and allow the tax budget cuts for the ultra rich to expire. No new taxes, no jobs. No new taxes, no new jobs. We must pass a, re a responsible tax plan that extends the unemployment benefits and gets the economy moving again. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purposes, the gentleman from Illinois rise? Gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, as a small business owner, I understand firsthand the implications of the government adding additional red tape and additional regu regulations. One clear example of this is the Dodd-Frank bill. The Dodd-Frank bill was supposed to impose clear rules and regulations on the financial industry so that another economic disaster could be averted. However, this single piece of legislation has imposed more uncertainty into the marketplace. The bill imposes literally hundreds of new rules and regulations, most of which, would have, which haven't even been written yet. As a result, businesses are not growing and they're not creating jobs. And this is a large part because they don't understand what tomorrow will bring. I did have an opportunity to talk to a, a smaller bank back in my district who said, we're not growing with the exception of adding people into our compliance department to cross the T's and dot the I's but not a single person was growing in order to try to uh, get additional liquidity into the marketplace and help small businesses. Rather than pile on rule after rule, we should implement smart regulations that truly protect consumers. The last thing we want is another financial disaster. So we should examine the implications of the rules and regulations and ensure that the right regulations are in place and get America back to work. I yield back. For what purposes? The gentleman from New Jersey rise. Gentleman is recognized. Madam well, Speaker, the majority has held 891 votes in this chamber, and we still see no plan for job creation. To make matters worse, my colleagues across the aisle have now focused their efforts on opposing a tax break for the middle class. They were opposing the extension of the payroll tax holiday enacted earlier this year that gave virtually all working Americans a much-needed tax cut, reducing taxes for over 160 million American workers. Economic uncertainty both here in the U.S. and abroad makes this a dangerous time to eliminate an important tax cut that is saving Americans' family an average of $1,000 a year. Failing to extend the payroll tax holiday will raise taxes on millions of Americans, taking over $120 billion out of the pockets of consumers and out of the economy. Furthermore, at the same time that the majority is working to raise taxes on the middle class, they are willing to cut off the unemployment insurance that has been keeping millions of Americans afloat. Madam Speaker, let's ensure that millions of Americans enjoy this holiday season and are not forced to worry about rising taxes or losing essential assistance, and I yield back. For what purposes does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Madam Speaker, I ask permission to address the House for one minute revise to extend my remarks. The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, last Friday the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics announced November's unemployment rate remained above 8 percent. 
Over 13 million American families are now without jobs. Nearly 25 million people are looking for full-time employment. The number of unemployed Americans has not consistently remained at such a high percentage since 1948. For the past 34 months, the American people have been depending on Congress and the President to cut Washington's wasteful spending and enact policies targeting job creation and economic growth. Since the Republicans regained the majority of the House in January, legislation has passed that allows small businesses to grow and create jobs. It is past time for the President and Liberal-controlled Senate to change course to put our hard-working American families back to work. In conclusion, God bless our troops who will never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism, as on December the 7th, we honor the heroes of World War II. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? The gentleman is recognized. LBO. Mr. Speaker, today the United States and Canadian governments will announce a Beyond the Border Agreement to ease border trade and travel in this era of, era of heightened security. I support this goal because Western New York, uh, our future depends on integrating our economy with the booming economy of Southern Ontario by expanding the peace bridge that connects our two communities. The Peace Bridge is the busiest passenger crossing at the northern border. Passengers using the bridge spend $133 million in Western New York annually in support of our retailers, sports franchises, airports, educational and cultural institutions. In Western New York, uh, Peace Bridge trade impacts $9.1 billion in business sales, supporting 60,000 local jobs and generating $2.6 billion in household income and $133 million in local tax revenue. All of this economic activity depends on a Peace Bridge that is free of congestion, one that is safe, reliable, and predictable. Uh, I applaud the efforts of this agreement and call on a renewed federal focus on northern border generally and the Peace Bridge uh, specifically. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Request permission to address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For a decade, the fundamentally flawed Medicare physician payment system has created uncertainty and instability not only in the health care system, but in the larger economy. Every year, physicians face the threat of reimbursement cuts, which in turn hinders their ability to provide the necessary care that patients need. The sustainable growth rate formula has constantly called for negative updates to physician payments, with the scheduled reductions accumulating year after year, but Congress has continually delayed the cuts. Congress has an historic opportunity to implement sound fiscal policy in the Medicare program in the context of broad economic reforms. I believe we must per pursue a fair, efficient, and affordable long-term solution to the Medicare SGR formula. I'm committed to working with my colleagues to pass common sense legislation that promotes efficiency, quality, and value, and ensures access to medical services for Medicare beneficiaries. Madam Speaker, I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from New York rise? The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yesterday I spoke with over 8,000 of my constituents during a telephone town hall to talk about the end of the open enrollment period for Medicare, which occurs at midnight tonight. We also talked about the savings they're now receiving as a result of the closing of the legendary prescription drug donut hole. More than 2.5 million Medicare recipients across the nation have saved $1.5 billion on their prescription drugs this year alone. In New York, we had, uh, we had 175 Medicare recipients, and they received a 50% discount on prescription drugs, totaling over $13. million in savings, an average of $650 per family. Yesterday's call was a reminder when I was talking to people like Bill from Williamsville and Joan from Livingston County that this is, we have to work hard to protect this absolutely critical program that ensures medical care for our seniors and allows them to live their later years in dignity. As my senior told me, Medicare is not an entitlement. It is a program we've spent our entire lives paying into, and I, for one, plan to protect it. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise to congratulate Ed Snyder, the owner of the Philadelphia Flyers Hockey Club, on being inducted into the United States Hockey Hall of Fame.
This is a special occasion, not only for the city of Philadelphia and for the Delaware Valley as a whole, but particularly for those uh, who love the game of hockey, uh, myself concluded. Ed, Ed's tremendous success with the Flyers franchise, winning two Stanley Cups and reaching the finals six times, contributed to making Philadelphia a Class A hockey town. However, the key is that he's really given back to communities. Through his organization, the Ed Snyder Youth Hockey Foundation, he teaches high-risk inner-city boys and girls from Philadelphia the game of hockey, but it prepares them as well with life skills for success in school and in life as well. Hard work, honest effort, teamwork, dedication, solid work ethic are instilled in these children as life lessons and values as part of participation in this program. It's through these lessons that is organization helps our children become good and productive citizens. His philanthropic cause is significant to our region and to these young children in our area. Congratulations to Ed Snyder on this recognition. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Illinois rise? The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to join thousands of activists participating in the 16 Days campaign by speaking out against violence against women. Violence against women is a violation of fundamental human rights. It is a global problem of epidemic proportions. One in three women worldwide is beaten, coerced into sex, or otherwise abused over the course of her lifetime. That is why I am proud to be working with Congressman Ted Poe to, in to reintroduce the International Violence Against Women Act. This important bill would require a comprehensive strategy to prevent and respond to violence against women and girls internationally. Violence against women is not just a humanitarian tragedy, it is a global health menace and a threat to national security. The United States can play a significant role in protecting the human rights of all women and ending the violence against our sisters around the world. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Delaware rise? Seek permission to address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to commemorate two very important events in our nation's history that occurred on December 7th. As we know, today is National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. We pray for the more than 3,500 U.S. soldiers and civilians who were killed or wounded in defense of our nation that day. The sacrifices they made 70 years ago are not unlike the sacrifices that our soldiers and their families are being asked to make today. December 7th is also an important milestone for the founding of our nation. Today is Delaware Day, the 224th anniversary of Delaware's ratification of the United States Constitution, making Delaware the first state to join the nation. Delaware's founding fathers saw the vision and genius of the form of government laid out in our Constitution. It is this vision and this document that continues to guide everything we do today. So let us take time today to remember the contributions every generation has made to protect the values and freedoms upon which this great nation was founded. Thank you. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, the last time the Republicans controlled the House back in 2006, a newspaper columnist called it the Seinfeld Congress because like Seinfeld, which was a show about nothing, the 109th Congress was a Congress about nothing. Absolutely nothing got done. Now the House Republicans have upped the ante. They've got an agenda filled with Seinfeld legislation, a bunch of bills about nothing. Tomorrow, for example, we're considering the so-called farm dust bill. Now, ignore for a moment the fact that it's more about mines and smelters and concrete plants than it is about farms. House Republicans want to ban an EPA rule that the EPA administrator has said she has no intention of issuing. Why are we wasting time prohibiting a rule that's not being issued when we've got real problems like a struggling economy and millions of people out of work. As Seinfeld might say, yada, yada, yada. I yield back.
For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky rise? The gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, with an average margin of victory of more than 40 points, an undefeated season, and a win in the state championship that Sports Illustrated called the team's finest offensive performance of the year, there can be no more debate. Trinity High School Shamrocks are the best high school football team in the country. Friday's 62-21 victory over Scott County in the 6A final completed a 25-game win streak, secured a second straight state title, and capped a season in which Trinity didn't just beat the competition, they rocked them. Over five playoff games, Trinity outscored its foes by more than 240 total points. They never trailed in the second half all season. They crushed top-tier out-of-state competition and avenged their only 2010 loss. After facing Trinity, Scott County's coach called the Shamrocks the best team in Kentucky football history. This was a true team effort, and thanks to the leadership and dedication of 40 seniors, these student athletes have achieved a perfect record and deserve to bring a national title home to Louisville. I ask my colleagues to join me today in congratulating Coach Beatty, the team, and the entire Trinity community on an incredible championship and an amazing 2011 season. Way to go, Rocks. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island rise? And the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, we simply cannot leave Washington before extending the payroll tax cut and unemployment assistance. With our economy still struggling and unemployment remaining unacceptably high at 10.4 percent in my home state of Rhode Island, now is not the time to take more money out of the pockets of hardworking families. Allowing the payroll tax cuts to expire at the end of this month will mean less money in the hands and in the pockets of 600,000 hardworking Rhode Islanders. It is absolutely critical that we extend the payroll tax cut, which is saving working families an average of $1,000 per year and would add $400 million to Rhode Island's economy next year. We have to do everything we can to strengthen our middle class families who are struggling to make ends meet and provide assistance to those families who need it most. If Congress does not extend emergency unemployment assistance, thousands of Rhode Islanders, as well as millions of Americans who rely upon this critical safety net will lose their assistance. This will have a devastating impact on these families and on our economy. Rather than providing subsidies to big oil companies and arguing for more tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires, it's time for Congress to stand up for American families and to extend the payroll tax cut and unemployment compensation. Thank you. General lady from Minnesota, rise. General lady is recognized. Madam Speaker, the temporary payroll tax cut is putting money into the economy and pockets into 160 million Americans. And now my Republican colleagues are demanding harmful cuts to working families and seniors to offset these middle class tax cuts. A better idea is to cut from the $1 trillion in special interest tax earmarks identified by the bipartisan Simpson Bowles Commission. Let's cut $2 million in ear tax for wooden aero manufacturers. Let's cut $40 million in earmarks for the owners of NASCAR race car tracks. And let's cut $235 million in earmarks for rum producers in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. These tax earmarks are unfair and they're just unaffordable. To the 99% of Americans who don't have a lobbyist, Sorry, you missed out on the special interest bonanza. Congress needs to protect working families. Let's pass President Obama's middle class payroll tax cut and help our families and our economy now. I yield back. For what purpose is the gentleman from Kansas rise? The gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, the American economy is crying out for certainty. Every day, the instability created by new Washington rules regulations, new taxes, et cetera, makes it harder for the economy to recover and harder for small businesses to create jobs. That's why today I stand in full support of the Restoring Congressional Authority for Major Regulations Act, known as the RAINS Act. As our federal agencies churn out regulations by the truckload, it's our small businesses, those very entities that we expect to create jobs and are struggling to survive, that are burdened with implementing them. In fact, regulations cost the economy $1.75 trillion per year. New regulations this year alone will cost business over $60 billion. 
all driving up the cost of doing business and putting more people out of work. I'm supporting the RAINS Act because this legislation will provide Americans with an additional level of accountability when it comes to job-killing regulations from government agencies. Ms. Madam Speaker, it's time we stand up for small business owners, and it's time we do all that we can to remove the barriers Washington is putting in their way. Let's come together as Congress, and let's help America get back to work again. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California rise? The gentlelady is recognized. Madam Speaker, later today the House will vote on the RAINS Act. This is a terrible piece of legislation that will make it next to impossible to protect Americans' health or the environment. It would allow either chamber of Congress to stop efforts to keep our water and air clean or to protect the public from unsafe food by simply doing nothing. This bill sets up a congressional approval requirement that is a recipe for more gridlock. It would mean more bureaucracy and more delay, generating uncertainty for businesses and weaker rules to protect consumers. Sherwood Bullard, the former Republican chairman of the House Science Committee and one of our most thoughtful former colleagues, recently wrote a scathing piece in The Hill about the RAINS Act. He said the bill would result in, and this is a quote, a virtual shutdown of the system that would leave the public exposed. Madam Speaker, the RAINS Act is an outrageous effort to throw out a system that has protected American families and communities for more than 100 years. I urge my colleagues to join me in voting down this irresponsible, this misguided legislation. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from the great state of Michigan rise? Gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise today to oppose nationwide efforts to suppress voter turnout for the 2012 election, including state legislation imposing strict photo ID requirements. These new regulations would disproportionately burden seniors, people with disabilities, the poor, and minorities. In Michigan, we have seen aggressive purges of voter rolls, which can disenfranchise low-income voters who have moved to a new address. Half a million Michiganders don't have a driver's license or state ID. How are they supposed to make their voices heard if these rules are passed? Let's be clear. These efforts are about one thing and one thing only, silencing voters. America is a beacon of democracy, and to limit voter access is hypocritical and wrong. Madam Speaker, I don't have to tell you about the shameful times in Americans' history where power and intimidation were used to prevent Americans from voting. We must learn from our past, fight voter suppression efforts in the courts, in state legislatures, here in Washington, and most importantly, on Election Day. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Hawaii rise? The lady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. December 7, 1941, a day which will live in infamy. Words of President Roosevelt, I represent Pearl Harbor. On this day, let us not forget the brave people who gave their lives at Pearl Harbor. On this day, let us not forget this act of unprovoked dastardly aggression which propelled us into a war. On this day, let us not forget how the people of this nation were unmatched in their evidence of loyalty and patriotism. Let us remember, because we need to be that people again, to continue our fight, to maintain our position as the greatest nation in the world. Let us remember, because we need to show the compassion to those who are in need on these days. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back the remainder of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky rise? Madam Speaker, uh, I ask unanimous consent to take from the Speaker's table the bill H.R. 2055, making appropriations for military construction, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2012 and for other purposes, with the Senate amendment thereto, disagree to the Senate amendment, and agree to the conference requested by the Senate. The clerk will report the title. H.R. 2055, an act making appropriations for military construction, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2012, and for other purposes. Without objection, so ordered. Madam Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman from Washington rise? Uh, I have a motion to instruct at the desk. 
The clerk will report the motion. Mr. Dix, if Washington moves that the managers on the part of the House at the conference on the disagreeing votes of the two houses on the Senate amendment to the bill H.R. 2055 be instructed to recede to the Senate on the higher level of funding for the Department of Veterans Affairs medical and prosthetic research account. Pursuant to Clause 7 of Rule 22, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Dix, and the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Rogers, will each control 30 minutes, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks on the motion to instruct. Without objection. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, Madam Speaker, the motion instructs conferees to provide the highest level of funding for medical and prosthetic research. This program helps the Department of Veteran Affairs develop cutting-edge treatments for veterans and their families. It is fully integrated throughout the medical community through partnerships with academic affiliates, nonprofits, and commercial entities, as well as other federal agencies. It is unique because both the clinical care and research occurred together. The medical and prosthetic research program plays a vital role in advancing the health and care of our nation's veterans. Some of the areas that the medical and prosthetic research program focus on include mental health research, prosthetics, traumatic brain injury, and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. The program has emphasized uh, efforts to improve the understanding and treatment of veterans in need of mental health care. We hear a lot about the casualties of war and soldiers who have sacrificed their lives in duty. However, over the past few years, the VA has begun to examine the psychological wounds of post-traumatic stress disorder. The motion will provide funding for the VA to care for veterans returning home from Iraq and Afghanistan who may suffer from depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. Funding for medical and prosthetic research in the House reported bill was inadequate, and during floor consideration, the House majority agreed to increase funding by $22 million. While I was pleased to see this increase, I believe we need to do more. The Senate passed bill funds this program at the 2011, FY 2011 level, enacted level, which is $51 million higher than the House passed level. I believe the higher funding level should be maintained because of the impact this research can have on the everyday life of our nation's veterans. This nation must get its fiscal house in order. However, even in our, in an austere budget, we need to make room to fully fund our priorities. The medical and prosthetic research program is a high priority. I'm sure that all of my colleagues would agree we can never repay Americans' veterans for the sacrifice they have made for our country. As a first installment, we should make a substantial investment in health care research for our veterans. And I urge a, a yes vote on the motion to instruct, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Washington reserves his time. The gentleman from Kentucky. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, this motion to instruct is well-intentioned but uh, unnecessary. The motion would urge adoption of the Senate pass level for VA medical research, which is $50 million above the House pass level. We all support our veterans and honor their uh, service and sacrifice, and we, of course, support the important research work uh, the VA is doing for our veterans in fields such as traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. And we provided a robust level of funding for this research in the House passed version of the bill at a time when our overall funding targets were uh, constrained. In fact, the House bill provided a total of $531 million for uh, VA medical research an increase of $22 million above what the White House and the VA requested. In addition, the VA still has $71 million in unobligated research funding left over from previous years. 
that could be put to use. So even without the increase, the program level would still be well above the 2011 level. We all agree that medical research at the VA is undeniably important. And we want to do the best that we can for our veterans, particularly those in need of medical assistance. On that, there is no difference between the ranking minority member and myself and between the members of the subcommittee. I can reassure the members that we will work with our House and Senate colleagues to determine the appropriate level uh, for uh, VA research uh, to continue to support and honor the service of our veterans. While this motion is not necessary, I understand and agree with its intent. And I will work with the ranking member, and with reservations, I will accept the motion at this time. I reserve the balance. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Washington. Um, I would ask for a vote on uh, my motion to instruct. And I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Kentucky. I yield back the balance. The gentleman from Kentucky yields back all time. Yielded back and without objection. The previous question is ordered. The question is on the motion to instruct. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. And in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And the motion is agreed to. The gentleman from Washington. I ask for a recorded vote. The gentleman asks for the yeas and nays. I ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having arisen, the yeas and nays are ordered. And pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20 for the proceedings on this question will be postponed.
Clerk will report the title. H.R. 1540, an act to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2012 for military activities of the Department of Defense for military construction and for defense activities of the Department of Energy to prescribe military personnel strengths for such fiscal year and for other purposes. Without objection, so ordered. For what purpose does the gentleman from Washington rise? I have a motion to instruct at the desk. And the clerk will report. Mr. Smith of Washington moves that the managers on the part of the House at the conference on the disagreeing votes of the two houses on the Senate amendment to the bill H.R. 1540 be instructed to insist on the amendments contained in subtitle one of title five of the House bill, sections 581 through 587 relating to improved sexual assault prevention and response in the armed forces. Pursuant to clause seven, of Rule 22, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Smith, and the gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, will each control 30 minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. And the gentleman is recognized. This is a very important provision of the House bill dealing with better combating sexual assault within the military. Uh, this is a significant problem that has been documented by many studies and many media reports. I want to particularly congratulate members of my committee, uh, Ms. Sanchez, Ms. Songus, Ms. Spire, Ms. Susan Davis, who have taken a leadership role in this to try to implement policies to control sexual assault within the military. The provisions that we've put together in the House uh, help move us forward towards addressing that issue, make sure that it takes on the importance that it deserves, and empower the military uh, to make the decisions they need to better protect against sexual assault within the military. Um, I particularly applaud Ms. Songus as her motion um, to stick to the House provisions in this area. I urge the conference committee to do that going forward, and with that I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Washington reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from California. I'd reserve our time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield two minutes uh, to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Slaughter. Gentleman from gentlelady from New York, recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and Madam Speaker, good morning. Uh, sec afternoon, I guess it is. Sexual assault in the military continues to be a serious problem. It impacts thousands of service women and men each year. While I'm pleased with the recent improvements made by the Department of Defense. There remains much more to be done. It is vital that we do all we can to protect the men and women of the military who protect us. I'm very pleased that both the House and the Senate passed language improving the military's response to sexual assault in their respective versions of the National Defense Authorization Act. Earlier this week, I sent a letter along with Representative Turner and 45 colleagues to the House and Senate Armed Services Committees asking them to strongly consider the House passed provisions dealing with military sexual assault. The language contained in the House version makes necessary improvements to protect our service women and men. Specifically, the House passed language strengthens the rights of sexual assault victims by clarifying victim access to legal counsel and record maintenance and confidentiality, which are critically important. It also ensures expedited unit or station transfer when a service member has been victimized. Imagine being a victim of rape, which one young soldier told me about at a hearing, while serving in the military, and every morning she had to salute her rapist. That's why the members of our armed forces have experienced and will continue to experience if we don't do something to change that situation. The House passed language also stresses the need for the NDAA to include comprehensive training and education programs for sexual assault prevention within the Department of Defense. The Senate version does not include this uh, protection, which is part of H.R. 1709, the Force Protection and Readiness Act, which I introduced earlier this year. I'm pleased this motion to instruct conferees on the NDAA recognizes the importance of this issue, and I ask the conferees to seriously consider including the strongest possible language to prevent and appropriately respond to incidents of sexual assault in the military, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from California. Gentleman from California. 
continue to reserve. Continues to reserve. The gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At this point, I yield the, the balance of my time to Ms. Saugus of Massachusetts. She will control the time from this point forward. Um, so I yield the balance of our time to Ms. Saugus, and then she can yield Without as much objection. to herself as she wants. Without objection. And the gentlelady from Massachusetts will, will, will control the balance of the time. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. And the gentlelady is recognized. While one in six women will experience sexual assault in her lifetime, as many as one in three women leaving military service report that they have experienced some form of military sexual trauma. By the Pentagon's own estimate, as few as 13.5% of sexual assaults are reported. Additionally, while 40% of sexual assault allegations in the civilian world are prosecuted, this number is a staggeringly low 8% in the military. The military has been slow to take the appropriate actions necessary to protect victims of sexual assault. For example, rape victims still do not yet have the right to a unit or duty location transfer following an assault. This means victims of sexual assault are often forced to live and work alongside their perpetrator, facing repeated stress and trauma due to the constant contact they may have with an assailant that is part of their unit. As unbelievable as it sounds, this is exactly what happened to Marine Lance Corporal Maria Lauterbach, who accused her assailant of rape and then spent the next eight months exposed to the accused rapist, who later murdered her and buried her with the body of her unborn son in his backyard. Although these events happened in 2007, the Department of Defense has not adopted provisions that would allow victims to escape constant contact with their assailant. We ask men and women who serve in the military to put their lives on the line for our country, and they shouldn't fear harm from their fellow service members. We simply must do more to protect them. In May, this House passed H.R. 1540, which included strong bipartisan provisions that would allow victims of sexual assault the right to transfer units, the right to counsel, the right to pri privileged communications between a victim and a victim advocate, and the right to get records of their sexual assault so they can be eligible for veterans' benefits. These provisions came from a bipartisan bill that I introduced with Mr. Turner of Ohio. Our language stipulates that confidential communications cannot be used by the defense attorney against the victim during court proceedings, and they remain truly confidential. These provisions will encourage more victims to come forward and get the help they need to heal, and will encourage more victims to participate in the legal process of pro prosecuting perpetrators of sexual assault, both of which are critical to maintaining readiness and unit cohesion in the military. These provisions also establish full-time sexual assault response coordinators and victim advocates, ensure they are well-trained for the job and able to properly serve victims of sexual assault. The 2009 Defense Task Force report on sexual assault in the military services found that current victim advocates and sexual assault response coordinators are unprepared for the duties of the position. In the words of a current unit victim advocate, quote, I would truly be unprepared if a sexual assault were to occur and my services were needed. It is my opinion that active duty victim advocates are not prepared to deal with sexual assaults and could potentially deter individuals from coming forward. Having full-time SARCs at VAs with extensive training and certification will ensure that they are truly a valuable resource to their unit and to victims who come forward. This language also improves the retention of sexual assault records and guarantees that victims of sexual assault will have lifetime access to these records for a variety of purposes, such as being considered for veterans' benefits and given priority consideration for counseling at Veterans Affairs. Currently, survivors of sexual assault have to jump through multiple bureaucratic hurdles to prove that their symptoms are connected to an incident of sexual assault in the military in order to be prioritized for mental health counseling or be eligible for ben benefits. Service members find it difficult to obtain documentation proving their sexual assault once they have left the services because many of these documents are destroyed at DOD after only a few years. 
This language ensures that the, doc the documents are maintained. This language also requires DOD to prepare a record of all court proceedings in which a charge of sexual assault is adjudicated and provide a copy to the victim. Because victims of sexual assault serve as a witness rather than an active participant in trials where their case is litigated, they often do not understand the outcome of their case. These records are prepared where convictions result, but when charges are dismissed or when a perpetrator is found innocent, the victim has no reliable way to understand what happened and why his or her case was dismissed. Making sure victims understand the outcome of their case is important to providing closure for victims and making sure they are an active, respected participant in the legal process. It will help to alleviate much of the mistrust that service members and victims of sexual assault in the military harbor when it comes to how a sexual assault case will be handled if they make a report. Similar provisions were included in the Senate's version of the defense authorization, but these provisions do not clearly spell out a victim's right to counsel and do not provide for a comprehensive education and training program. Yesterday, a bipartisan group of 47 members, led by Mrs. Slaughter and Mr. Turner, sent a letter to the chairman and ranking member of both the House and Armed Services Committee in support of the House's language. This motion simply instructs our conferees to insist on the House language, language that will protect our service women. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support the motion to instruct conferees. With that, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, excuse me, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlelady reserves her time. The gentleman from California. We continue to reserve. Continues they to have reserve. Further speakers. Do you have further speakers? Gentlelady from I, Massachusetts. I do. Gentlelady from Massachusetts. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from California who has taken such an interest in this very grave issue and played an important leadership role. Gentlelady uh, from California is recognized here. for two minutes. Uh, thank you to um, Ms. Sangas and thanks to the ranking member, Mr. Smith, for bringing this motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to say a few words here. Um, this is a cancer that is eating up our military. And for 25 years, we have debated and discussed and reported on it, and yet the numbers are staggering. By DOD's own estimates, 19,000 men and women in the military each and every year are sexually assaulted or raped. Only 13% actually report these sexual assaults and rapes. 90% of them are involuntarily, honorably discharged. There is a message in the military, shut up, take an aspirin, go to bed, sleep it off. And these very modest elements are really very important. But if we're really going to deal with this issue, if we're truly going to say that you are no longer going to be more likely to be a victim of violence in the military by a fellow officer than by the enemy, if we're really going to be able to change that construct, then we're going to have to take the reporting of these crimes away from the chain of command and put it in a separate office where we will have experts, both military and civilian, that will be able to prosecute these cases and actually uh, investigate them. Right now, there is a huge conflict of interest. I spoke on the floor this morning about Petty Officer DeRoche, who was raped by two officers in Thailand when they were on um, port of call. She was raped twice by each of these men, she was, then went to report it and was told to leave it alone. She was then put in a, a medical hold for 24 hours for days. And then what happened? She was eventually allowed to leave the ship and be put in a, another service uh, setting. But you know what happened to those two assailants, both of whom admitted that they had raped her? Both of whom admitted they had raped her. May I have an additional minute? I'm pleased to yield you an additional minute. Gentlemen, it's recognized.